As I mentioned in the text-based introduction in Canvas, the lecture that you're about to hear from Dr. Clavel Hall from the spring 2019 semester was based on the same readings that you have for this particular session. Now, one of the things that happened during this particular lecture was there was actually a great deal of discussion that occurred. And throughout the recording, I'm going to pause it on a couple of occasions because either I want to point to specific aspects of the two chapters that they were talking about, or just to ask you some questions that I'd like you to think about along the way. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Clavel Hall. Reading this week compared to your prior weeks, uh, we're going to be looking at a little bit at the legal issues in translational research and some of the principles that uh, surround the ethical issues and the ANA code of ethics. I gave you what I thought was uh, a little primer, a short article on it, and uh, as well as uh, sharing the ANA code with you. And we'll talk a little bit about moral distress. And I want to ask, when's the last time either of you have had to refer in your nursing practice or otherwise to the ANA Code of Ethics for Nursing. So it's like an, a ubiquitous presence in your practice. Okay, anyone else have run into ethical dilemmas where you had to bring up this topic? This is the first occasion where I wanted to pause the recording because I think Dr. Clavo Hall has proposed a important question here. And what I'd like you to do is when I finish speaking here in a minute or so, I want you just to pause the recording and reflect upon her question for a minute because really what she's getting at is in the White et al. textbook on in chapter 16 on pages 313, 314, and 315, it looks at the issue of ethics in practice. So they're not really focusing as much here on the research aspect, whereas the rest of that chapter and all of the Bronson et al. chapter uh, focuses specifically upon ethics around conducting research or around trying to translate research into practice. But the reality is, is that each of you, almost on a daily basis, are faced with ethical issues that would fall under the ANA's Code of Ethics for Nurses. Now, in some cases, they're very small ones that you're able to make decisions about very easily. But in some cases, they are things that stick with you and that you find making decisions about difficult. So what I'd like you to do here now is pause the recording for a minute and think about the last time you were faced with an ethical decision that you had to make as a part of your practice. Because while I've edited out the student voices in the recordings and all of the recordings because I didn't have their permission to use their words, listening to the examples that they gave in response to Dr. Clavel Hall's question was incredibly interesting for me and I know in the way in which the students discussed each of those issues and the way in which Dr. Clavel Hall used those issues or those examples throughout the remainder of the lecture it was clear that both Dr. Clavel Hall as well as the students in the class found those examples to be just as interesting and just as useful as I did just as a third-party listener. I, I mean, I do definitely feel like we run into that a lot as, as nurses because we, um, I know we're working towards becoming uh, independent practitioners, which is exciting. Um, but as nurses, you know, we do have these orders that are given to us from physicians. And, and you know, if it, so there's kind of like this, well, I'm the physician and I'm writing the order, but then there's like, does it make sense to be pursuing this path of treatment? And as a nurse practitioner, an advanced practice nurse, you should be developing the tools 
to ask those questions and educate people that you feel may not be using the most the best practices uh, or missing one of the uh, quadruple aims of uh, our best practices and that is what we're trying to equip you to do now so that you will have the uh, tools to question some of that type of treatment not to say it will stop but it makes you a stronger advocate for the patients and for the profession to be able to question th things like that uh, and start the conversation that's where this is fitting in so it's going to come up uh, it does happen and we try and go forward and see what we can do to make it a better experience for the patient and the provider uh, so what I want to go to here is we're talking a bit about uh, the legal issues as well as ethical issues. And when we talk about legal issues in healthcare, we're looking at things like somebody said, uh, I think it was Suzanne, that the uh, code of ethics uh, is throughout our practice. And I want to say the legal issues are also things that guide our practice and specifically through things like uh, the policies of the Board of Registered Nursing, which come from the federal levels, looking at the Food and Drug Administration trials, that uh, is something that is involved in translational research and uh, patent laws, as well as tort laws. And when I look at these three things, I'm looking at, we started this class talking about the 17 year odyssey. We, I've read places where now people are saying, well, it's 11 years, not 17 years. And I'm thinking, well, if I'm the person who needs the treatment, you have not helped me much if I still have to wait 11 years to get the proven evidence-based treatment. So it's still a long time. So my point to you in pointing out these three things is that the Food and Drug Administration laws the patent laws as well as the tort laws can be barriers to care. They, it can be uh, things that cause the, that contribute to the gap between bench to bedside practice. And as we look at this, patent laws, why do you think it might be a barrier to moving evidence from bench to bedside, patent law. Okay, this was another place where I found the discussion that they had fascinating. So in response to Dr. Clavel Hall's question, the students actually focus primarily upon the topics that you see in the Bronson et al. textbook in chapter four. So issues around human subjects research, issues around the Belmont principles, some of which obviously are discussed in the White et al. textbook as well when you start on page 316 there in the section on the ethical framework for the translation of evidence into practice. But what they did as they were providing these examples was they were pulling things from their own work environment. So they weren't necessarily things that were examples of research-based things, but they were practice-based examples that had research or translational research overtones to them. One of the examples that a student mentioned was she was working with oncology patients either on a ward or uh, in an oncology clinic and she referenced a particular drug a couple of years ago that the patent was about to expire and some organization w essentially extended the life of the patent for that particular drug, which prevented other drug companies from developing generic and cheaper versions of the drug, which she saw as you know a an impediment for those individuals that may have needed uh, cheaper uh, access to cheaper. Uh, medication. So that was one of the examples that, that she came up with uh, there that really didn't follow sort of the best evidence-based practice type. And, and there were several others that uh, folks brought in from 
you know, dealing with patients that come in that are out of network that you weren't able to care for to performing certain practices because they had, uh, you know, the, the hospital or the clinic that they were involved in had contracts with different companies or would um, essentially taking legal, you know, mitig trying to mitigate legal risks. So even though this particular procedure may have helped, because it had a high degree of risk to it, it wasn't undertaken. So there were a number of different examples that they used that I thought were fascinating. And again, this is one of those places where I'd encourage you to pause the recording and reflect upon your own practice and where you see these kinds of issues happening. And how ethical is it? Yeah, I, I worked in regulatory of drugs and devices on an international scale for a long time. And um, I solved many tragic cases of our Food and Drug Administration being influenced by lobbyists to delay also to delay the uh, introduction of better medicines, cheaper medicines into yes. our market. Yeah. Yes, and all of this is impacting care through through areas that are not considered even <coughs> medical organizations or medical institutions, yes. but it's being yes. very much a driver of health. And uh, as we see here, tort law, uh, the tort law, we're looking at situations where you have the... Uh, the civil actions with lawsuits by individuals against organizations or other individuals and with tort law that is uh, one area where you see cpgs at the center of that everybody understand what i'm saying when i say cpgs we've used that term a couple of times okay uh so with cpgs you've got your practice guidelines and the tort law, it's at the center of tort law because either the uh, plaintiff said that Ginny should have followed the uh, CPGs, the clinical practice guidelines, and she didn't. And thus, I developed an adverse uh, consequence from her treatment one way in tort, in tort law and in court. Or then we have the patient, uh, Eloisa, saying, yes, we have CPGs, and I adhere to them. So the fact that Stella lost her foot can't be blamed on me because I followed the CPG. So both of those are in the midst of uh, judicial fights in, within tort law. And a lot of that comes on, you remember our, uh, our continuum here, a lot of legal issues can come from all, all areas of our continuum, but we see them a lot more in T3, T4 area. Why do you think that might be? Why not so much at T0 or T1? So you don't find many people suing for abuse to the little white mice the little spotted pig, they, get, they start getting upset when you're looking at dogs and other animals, but where are you going to end up in court most? You're yeah. very much correct. So now we're, we're at Jenny's uh, HIV, uh, no, her hepatitis clinic, and she's got the evidence, and we know from Stella that everybody has the right. We know from uh, Tiffany that is based on the Belmont principle, but what area of the medical organization reviews this study and tells you, you need to have a consent, everybody needs to sign it, and it needs to be in a language that they understand because they have a right to refuse, according to a nurse practitioner, Stella, it, it, they have to be able to tell, to, to agree before nurse practitioner Ginny gives them Yes, and all of that is based on the Belmont report uh, to try and avoid when, I think it was Ginny, when you are doing 
projects in your case, your EBP projects, in my case, my research, certain quality improvement projects, when there is human subjects involved, people involved, we have to revert to the Belmont Report, which uh, looks at these things, uh, what Stella was talking about, the right to, to consent that's under autonomy, there's fidelity under there, that we have to keep people with justice, uh, that means the things about people walking into the cancer clinic with gunshot wounds, we have to decide does this person deserve some treatment, even though they may not be a patient of ours? So the IRB board will uh, will weigh in on human subjects uh, projects, and they will spell out and make sure that you are treating the human subjects fairly. The role of the, in, uh, the uh, internal review board is to make sure that the human subjects are protected and to make sure that the regulations, the legal part of it, that you are following the regulations uh, under health care. So when you go to uh, IRB, they can decide if your project is exempt or if you need additional specifications before you move forward. That is where those instructions that Jenny alluded to that have to be applied to each person, the IRB is going to make sure that Louise's proposal contains all of those specifications before they approve that project to be conducted in their organization. And the organization, the hospital or clinic or healthcare system, they can decide which types of projects they want to review because it's going on in their organization and they're liable for the health and well-being of the patients being cared for at their organization. So as Stella opened the door, she said some people just don't trust the, the research or the projects that are being done. Is this medication going to kill me? That goes back to some uh, research studies that have been conducted unethically. Do you remember reading about the Tuskegee study? Mm -hmm. uh, and I encourage you to go back and look at it. There are other studies where, uh, where people have been put at risk for the sake of scientific discovery. And that is not okay. And when we look at things like, uh, like autonomy, with autonomy, it's the self-determination and freedom of choice, as you've talked about. It's respect for the person. And that's where informed consent fits under autonomy. And uh, it's autonomy not just for the patient, but autonomy for the providers as well. What about the nurse practitioner who's being asked by someone that they know has been stopping for oxycodone from clinic to clinic? And Louisa decides that she does not want to give that person medication. Is she bound to do so just because she's a clinic provider? If she says, no, I don't feel comfortable. I'm not, it's not being used for the proper reason, or I can give an alternative medicine that's going to treat this without using this, uh, this potentially addictive medicine. The provider has autonomy as well as the uh, patient. And the beneficence, that's to do no harm, and you want to apply maximum benefit and justice goes to the concept of fairness, and make sure that you understand that the concept of fairness does not mean equal treatment to every person. It's equitable treatment. Equitable, yeah. Equitable treatment to every person under this okay. So those are some of the things that we are looking at. Any questions? So it was at this point that Dr. Clavel Hall concluded her lecture for the evening and the students began working on their group project again.
the remainder of the lesson focused upon two issues. The first was the A and A's code of ethics. So if you haven't skimmed through that material in the supplementary resources, I'd ask you to pause the video right now before we get into that those couple of slides so that you can actually um, just take a few minutes to review that material. And then once you've done that, come back down and start the video up again. So the Code of Ethics for Nurses, while it's not stated specifically in the document, essentially these are the ethical values, obligations, duties, and professional ideals that you as an individual nurse as well as the nursing profession as a collective should hold. And for the American Nurses Association, they believe that these nine principles or these nine uh, statements are non-negotiable. This should be your line in the sand, as it, as it were. I think we all understand that while we would have a goal for that to be our line in the sand, oftentimes as healthcare professionals, there are certain decisions and certain actions that are out of our control, which oftentimes prevent us from upholding these particular standards, which presents these ethical dilemmas that you've thought about in the earlier parts of this lecture, uh, based on Dr. Clavel Hall's uh, questions that she's asked. But at the end of the day, that the these nine items in this code of ethics are essentially the profession's commitment to society as a whole that you know this is how nurses see their role within the larger healthcare profession so i won't go into each of these specific uh, provisions that are listed here because you've had a chance to read through them in the supplementary material and you'll note that there's also a YouTube video following this lecture that provides a really basic brief understanding or outline of these specific nine provisions so I won't spend time going over each of them here just to have them on the screen and if you haven't scanned them already in the supplemental readings either pause the recording here and just read through each of these nine or better yet go back to the original document that's linked in the supplemental resources and take a look at them there. The last item that was included in the slide deck that Dr. Clavel Hall had prepared for this particular lesson was this topic of moral distress. And as you can see here, by definition, moral distress is the emotional state that arises from a situation when a nurse feels that they the ethically correct action to take is different from what they think is right and that presents a moral dilemma. I'd actually go a step further and say that it's also could occur when the ethically correct action is different than what the nurse is being forced to undertake because of policy or because of directive from the individuals or organization or the leadership within the organization. Interestingly, the American Association of Colleges of Nurses have actually created a framework to attempt to address moral distress. So you can see there's this 4A framework, um, ask, affirm, assess, and act. And I won't go into each of the steps there, but again, this is another one of those instances where I'd encourage you to pause the recording so that you can take a look at the screen and review each of the steps or each of the parts of those four A's that you see here in this framework. So to summarize both the portions that Dr. Clavel Hall presented as well as the last couple of slides here that I've talked about, the nature of the U.S. legal system, and by legal system I don't necessarily just mean courts of law, I mean the regulatory system that state governments as well as the federal government and its various agencies and institutes have put in place. So that larger regulatory and legal and structural regime that is in place really does contribute to the delay that we've been talking about throughout the course regardless if it's that 17 year delay or if it's less or more than that 
Um, and we've seen examples throughout where it has been more. Um, but that delay that exists in actually translating what we know from research into practice that happens at your level within the healthcare system. One of the other main takeaways from this is the fact that when you look at the ANA's code of ethics, while it must be adhered to, it really does create a tension oftentimes between the things that you should be doing or the things that are ethically appropriate to do and both the specific resources that you have, as well in some cases, the specific limitations that the regulatory regime or the leadership of your particular organization may place upon you. Finally, as you look at your own journey in terms of translating research into practice or engaging in the pro process of translational research, you need to make sure that you consider the legal and ethical implications of the decisions that you plan to make throughout your project. And while the institutional review board that you'll have to go through in order to get your project approved, both at the university level as well in most cases within your own healthcare organizations, will provide you with some guidance on that. A lot of what happens during research, regardless if it's bench research or translational research, happens at the level of the researcher. So it's important for each of you to have a sense of what is ethical translational research. So that's one of the reasons why these two chapters are so important and one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure we ended the course with this particular topic so that it was the last thing that you took away from this particular course. So that's it for the specific lecture on the uh, two chapters that you had to read this week, chapter four in the Bronson et al. textbook and chapter 16 in the White et al. textbook.